Well, good morning. We've got a few here already. If you are joining me, first of all, welcome. Great to have you with me. And if you want to, you can let me know who you are, maybe let you know where you are from. I'm going to give it a few minutes here because I know some other people are going to be joining in. And um, a few of you have let me know that you're going to do that, which is great. And then I've had some other people message me and said they were hoping to join in too. Uh, so again, go ahead and leave a comment in the chat so I can see who you are. All right. There's a there's a local, a good local friend. Good morning. Good morning back. Um, we're going to take a few minutes before we get started to let people join in. And this is exciting. First time doing this. I actually did kind of a mock uh, live stream the other night just to, to see if I could get the technology to work. But this is kind of my first official time doing it. So again, if you're just joining in, let me know who you are. And I've got my uh, my cup of coffee. I hope you have yours too. And we'll get started in just a few more minutes. Hey, there's a there's a friend from New York, New York, or close to, uh, to New York. I think a Rochester, New York area. I was born in Rochester, but a much different Rochester, Rochester, Minnesota. So yeah, we've got um, Pete Rue joining us. I'm gonna go ahead and say <laughs> say names up. That's all right. Leanne from, um, she's a, a local friend, and um, I think there might be a couple other folks joining locally and then people from other places and like i mentioned i have some friends that uh that responded to my facebook post yesterday that said they were planning on tuning in so this is exciting stuff and i'm going to give it just a few minutes for people to join in and then i'm going to let you know kind of where we're going and what we're doing um hey there's another good another good friend welcome welcome dan hey because um i'm i'm new to doing it this way could maybe somebody Post something in the chat. Let me know. Can you hear me okay? Um, looks like my mic level's all right, but that would be helpful. Just let me know if you can hear me, because that wouldn't be any fun to do this for a long time if you can't. If you're just showing up, um, feel free to let me know that you are here. Hey, there's another another good good local friend. All right, somebody says they can hear me well, so that is that is really good. Um, for those of you that don't know, this is my, I just, I did a little live stream the other night, just kind of as a trial run, but this is really the first time we're doing this officially and super excited. And I'm still getting to know the, the platform I'm using. So uh, just be patient with that, but we'll give it maybe about five minutes or so, um, see if some other people join in and um, then I'll kind of tell you where we're going from there. Um, I am going to do some Q and A at the end of this. And so if you have any questions, um, it's good if they're in the area of the end times or eschatology, but you may even have other biblical questions. So if you have those, um, just kind of keep track of them at the end. I'd love to answer some of those. Um, also get your thoughts on, you know, on how things went. And um, I'll mention that again later, but just know that I want to interact with people as well. And it looks like we've got a couple other people joining in. So if you want to, if you join in, let me know you're here. If you want to be uh, incognito, you can do that too. Hope everyone's having a great weekend um, so far. Um, I'm in uh, Twin Falls, Idaho, Southern Idaho, and it's been a little gray the past couple of days, but we just had some beautiful uh, weather before that and spring is definitely coming. Got a couple more. Again, let me know if you're here, if you'd like to do that. And we'll give it um, just two or three more minutes, and I'll kind of let you know where we're going and uh, and what we're doing. So I always like to have a joke or two, just because it's it's kind of fun. Um, and if those of you that know me, all my jokes are pretty much dad jokes, and they're all pretty much bad jokes. But uh, learned a new one just a couple of days ago, and even though. For those of you just joining in, um, you're not missing any important content yet. I'm just telling a joke. Um, but I always thought the problem, you go, you go back to the Garden of Eden and you've got the you know, Adam and Eve and, and God tells them certain things to do. And I always thought the problem was, was that they ate the fruit of the tree. But actually, 
Um, the problem was not the fruit on the tree, but the pear on the ground. Boo. <laughs> so anyway, I'm not going to tell jokes all morning. I, uh, I promise I won't do that. Um, there was also, I don't know if you heard about this, but the Catholic uh, priest um, that also became a lawyer. So then he was a father-in-law. Um, that's a popular one. Not really. Got a couple more joining in. <laughs> Let me know you're here if you'd like to do that. And again, we'll have some Q&A at the end. So if you have questions, you know, you can do those at the end. And you may have questions that come up through um, through the live stream as well. And you can feel free to ask to ask those as well. We'll give it just a, another minute or two and then we'll hit uh, we'll, we'll head right into it. Um, it is pretty cool. I'm, I'm not like a, a technical wizard by any stretch, but it is neat to live in a time where we can do things like this. And uh, sometimes the way I say it is we want to get the good news of Jesus Christ out as close as across the street and as far as across the world. And we have a chance to do this. And so one of the things I'm I'm doing, again, I have never live streamed before at all, except for the video I mentioned earlier that I did kind of as a trial the other day. But this is going to my YouTube channel and also to Facebook and to Twitter, which is now called called X. So I can send it to all those places at once. And I'm hoping that some people will see this content that might not have otherwise. And um, excuse me just a minute, just making a little chair adjustment. Uh, but it would be great to have other people tune in. So let me tell you um, kind of where we're going with this. And again, this is this is kind of a trial run. Um, I'm not sure how often I'll do this on, on Sundays. Um, but I want to do it at, at least once a month and um, and potentially um, more than that. And I try to pick a time that um, would be a little later, you know, for those of you on the East Coast or on Mountain Time, but not too early for those on Pacific Time. Um, and uh, so kind of figured out in between. But what we're going to do is um, we're going to look at just some short video clips because there's a whole lot right now. And you've probably seen this if you if you follow these things at all, but that the end is is right at hand, it's near, and there are several reasons for that. So I'm just going to play some clips and just briefly comment comment on them, and then I'm going to do a teaching, and I may do a little bit more teaching this morning um, because I know that there are some people. Awesome, we got a couple a couple from Texas that joined in. They said they can they can hear me, which is fantastic. Um, but a lot of you that are going to tune in now or that will watch this later, you know, know what I what I believe, at least basically, but I know some people are tuning in who might not. And so this morning, I'm going to do a little more teaching as kind of an on ramp to the way I look at the scriptures. Um, so we're going to look at some video clips first. I'm going to do a little teaching and then we'll spend some time together with some Q&A and getting your thoughts. And so what I'm going to do here is, um, is screen share some things. And I think that I can can I make that I can make this work right. And I could have picked from a number of different videos, but I'm just choosing some here that are from fairly uh, prominent people. And we're gonna see what they have to say about the end being near or being right at hand. And so I'm just pulling up this, this first clip and it's gonna take me just a moment here. In just a minute, I just got to get it queued up. This is actually um, Glenn Beck, and some of you probably know who he is. I actually appreciate a lot of his views politically. But um, basically, let me just get this um, get this screen share going. And I'm going to be a little bit clumsy with some of this just because it's my first time using this platform. Again, if you just joined us, uh, welcome. We're going to first look at just some some short video clips here with some people that have some ideas uh, that, you know, again, the end is right at hand. The end is here. Um, and this, um, I think you should be able to, to see this. Um, can somebody just let me uh, know that you can see this clip that's going to come up? I just want to make sure that you can see it. I, th I think you'll be able to see it okay, but you'll be able to hear it um, 
for sure. I'm pretty sure that you can that you can see it there. And so let's go ahead and listen to Glenn Beck, and he's going to be talking a little bit about red heifers. Some of you are thinking, what in the world did I get myself into? Testable myth. Okay. Hang on just a second. For some reason, I don't have sound there yet. Red heifers are the de detestable Sorry, religious myth, according to oh, I know the leader why. of Hamas. A red heifer in, in, um, in the Old Testament to be sacrificed has to have Hang on a second. I'm really sorry. I've got some some music in the background. I'm sorry. Let me get to have. Uh, yeah, I've got to get that off first. It's going to take me just a moment. I apologize. I'm sorry. Thanks for your patience. I just, I've got some music playing in the background. It's very beautiful, but it is going to be a big distraction. So I need to get rid of that. Why can't I get rid of that? All right. Now we're going to try this one more time. Like I said, I'm just getting used to to this, so I apologize. All right, let's back it up just a little bit. Here we go. Detestable myth. Okay. Red heifers are the de detestable religious myth, according to the leader of Hamas. A red heifer in, um, in the Old Testament to be sacrificed has to have uh, no more than two black or white hairs. And they check them. I mean, there's, I, I think there's probably, you know, I, I'm guessing there's a rabbi squad that goes out. So for those of you who don't know, in the Old Testament, you see this in the book of, of Leviticus, where it does talk about these red heifers. So, so Glenn Beck is referencing back to that. And they look and they check the heifer. It has to be unblemished, all red hair. And that's a one in 50,000 chance that your red heifer is going to be born like that. Um, and it cannot have more than two black or white hairs, uh, even before having their ears tagged a common practice with livestock that would uh, disqualify them for ceremonial use. But these four heifers remain blemish free. And according to the Temple Institute rabbis, they want to carry out this detestable, uh, uh, what did he call it, a myth and a ceremony before Passover. So just before Easter, only nine heifers have been sacrificed since Moses. Nine. And that happened between Moses and the year 70 AD. And the feeling is, or the, the myth of the Bible, is the 10th red heifer ceremony would bring in the Messianic Age. I realize that Glenn Beck, he, he's being sarcastic. In other words, he's not saying that it's a myth. He believes it's it's true, and he's kind of mocking the people that don't. Now, I don't know about you, but those people who are like, I think Jesus is coming soon. <laughs> They're so crazy. So I don't believe any of that craziness. Um, but um, they bring in the messianic age. Now, so one interesting thought here is um, in the end times, there's this idea of this age and the age to come. And most believers believe that we're still waiting for the age to come, which is called the Messianic age, which is interesting because did not Messiah already come. But just keep in mind for now, all I want to say about this particular video is that, that Glenn uh, Beck, and, and there's 
quite a bit of this going around now, even a few years ago, like there was a rancher in Texas who sent red heifers to Israel. And a lot of people see that as part of the rebuilding of the temple, the reinstitution of the animal sacrificial system, etc. And so what I'm going to do now is go to um, another another video. And it's going to take me just a minute to get that queued up. This is um, Jimmy Evans, who, uh, and one of the things I want you to notice is just how many views these have like um the one we just looked at uh glenn beck just posted that five days ago it has four hundred thirty-six thousand views um so so pretty pretty amazing well another thing we see lately is this eclipse that somehow these eclipses are going to loom large um in the end times and there's one coming up on april 8th so let me now I'm just going to go one more time and and uh, to share to share this screen so you can see this other clip. Uh, we've got some more people that have joined in. Kenny says hello. Um, yeah, just looking at some of these comments, and again, uh, we will we will go over these um, some of these later. Um, yeah. But I'm, I'm looking at them now, and we'll go over them a little bit later together. But let's go ahead to the second clip. Again, this is a Jimmy Evans, who is interviewing a, a gal. I didn't catch her name, but talking about the eclipses, the one coming on April 8th, and then other eclipses and how they relate to this end time scenario. So let's pull this up. And I've just got to get it queued up to the right spot. Let's see, about four... Okay, so we're going to queue this up. It's in the heavens that God created for us in his, um, in his creation, the heavens and the sun and the moon and stars. Well, Jesus said in Luke 21 that you just read concerning the end times, there'll mm -hmm. be signs in the mm -hmm. sun, moon, and stars. Well, signs point to stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. so, yes, absolutely. Like when you're on the highway and you see a sign that says, you know, Albuquerque, 100 miles, is pointing right. you to the fact that you're getting close. So these signs that we're seeing, and there have been other signs astronomically, the Revelation 12 sign that happened in 2017, which you talk about in your book, uh, un unbelievable sign there. But this is not the only sign, but these two, actually there's three... Now, just something to notice there quickly is that he says that there was some type of sign in 2017 that was from Revelation 12. No scripture or anything to back that up, but just an assumption. Jimmy Evans, I'm not making this up. Um, I actually saw a little clip of him a while ago, and he was saying that all pastors know this. And first of all, when I was a pastor, I didn't know this. But you're supposed to bury people with their heads facing west at a little bit of an angle. I I'm not making this up. Uh, because when Jesus comes, it will be like the lightning from the east to the west. And if your head was to the west and you were tipped up a little bit, like here's your your head, uh, it would be easier for you to see Jesus coming first. Uh, but let's go on and see what they have to say about these eclipses. Eclipses we're going to talk about. But this is a major, major sign of something happening to America. Do you believe that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And interestingly, the 2017 eclipse was exclusively over the United States. Um, and that's that's rare. Most most of the time eclipses occur over the ocean or, or they partially come over the U.S. Um, but for it to occur um, just on the United States and go across uh, 14 contiguous states is is rare. Eclip now, one thing you may or may not know. Um, most of the authors that, that write on the end times, people that speak on the end times, people that blog or vlog or whatever they do in the end times are, are from America. There are certainly exceptions, but, but there's this idea that America just has to be front and center in the end times. And one of the questions we always need to ask ourselves when we're looking at the Bible is, who is it written to? And, and they're speaking specifically of Revelation. Was, was John the inspired 
writer of Revelation, was America really first and foremost in his mind? Eclipses in themselves are not necessarily rare, you know, um, but for them to, uh, before the um, August 27th, the last eclipse um, uh, visible from coast to coast was almost 100 years earlier on June 8th, 1918, but it wasn't exclusive to our nation. Um, the one that was exclusive last time was January 11th, 1880, a total solar eclipse occurred exclusive, exclusively over the continental U.S. And I think you've got enough there. And, you, and you'll see there's a there's a plethora of different videos you can look at about this upcoming eclipse and how certainly it's it's a, you know, it looms large in terms of the end times. Um, we're going to now um, look at a clip from a, a very well-known um, pastor. And by the way, I am not meaning to demean any of these people personally, because uh, my my view is that most people who teach these things, most, not all, but most are sincere, and they're teaching things that we think are correct. I just, I want to read a couple comments before, before we go to this um, last clip, um, but just a couple of these comments here. Um, somebody's saying, clearly this person doesn't know the Bible. Um, somebody just says, hello, Pastor Joel, hello to you. Um, somebody says super swell Joel, which is kind of a nickname I picked up years ago. Good job. Looks good. Sounds good. Great. Thank you for telling me that. Um, someone says, how many times will they say we are at the end of the world before people can say they are wrong? Someone's saying, I feel sorry for people, um, that think that another temple has to be built. And again, that's part of the red heifers. That's, um, you'll hear people talk about the blueprints are there. The utensils are there. Um, the Levitical priests are there, and we're going to talk about some of this. But let me go to this this last clip because I found this again. I think this person is probably sincere, um, but I just was a little bit taken aback uh, by what they actually share here. Uh, I just got to pull it up. Thanks again for your patience as I'm just learning how to pull up these different clips. Okay, so I'm just going to share this screen again. Not long ago, Rita Levy Montalcini celebrated her 103rd birthday, and then it's likely you're hearing something of. I'm going to pull this back. Hey everybody, this to the beginning. Again, you should be able to see it on your screen. Listen to this. This is probably one of the most absolute, the most, the single one, most absolute, bizarre, and yet effective, I pray, podcast that we've ever done or ever will do. And that is that we're going to address now, we're going to leave you, as it were, a time capsule that the rapture has just happened. What are you going to do now? So serious are we about this that we are going to be making flash drives. We're going to get a bunch. And eventually, when we have them, we'll make them available for you to get and to have in your home for you to leave behind with those who have been left behind. So this is important. We've all preached about the rapture and there's been bozos that have said for years, it's not going to happen. Well, it just did. So, so you caught that. And again, I don't mean to be snarky or take personal shots, but if you're someone who, who doesn't happen to believe that we're waiting for a rapture um, and that maybe that means something different than, than a lot of people think it means um, it's not just that you haven't studied the Bible well, but you are in fact, a bozo. I just, it's a, it's a fun word. Bozo is a fun word, but I, I just uh, wanted to point that out. You're bozos if you don't believe this. That's what we're going to be bringing to you today. What are you going to do? What do you do next if you find yourself left behind? Stay tuned. Real Life presents the Jack. I'm at a loss as to 
um, what to feel, not what to say. I know exactly what to say, but I'm at a loss for what to feel. You're watching this right now because what you heard about has happened. What you have been told, what you clearly rejected to believe and failed to embrace and to believe is what you've heard, read about, your friends have told you, your kids have been telling you, your parents have been telling you. There's even been the movies that have been made of it, but you have in fact been left behind and it's been covered up. Are you watching this right now? What's happening? There's a whole lot of people missing in the world right now and you're scared and you're terrified and you should be because what's in store for you um, is something that I'm not quite sure how to answer because the Bible is so incredibly clear in one point regarding possibly you that it terrifies me to bring it up. But on the flip side, if you're listening to this right now and the rapture has taken place and you've been left behind, then if you have never heard the gospel and for whatever reasons you're watching this right now, you need to pay close attention. Okay. And so again, I'm going to assume there um, and, and just look at the, um, look at the views. This was made two days ago. 366,000 views. Wow. And we can assume um, that that uh, Jack Hibbs is is sincere. Again, I, I, I do think that as someone who who was a pastor for several years and then was in full-time um, music ministry several years before that. So I, I know a lot of pastors talked um, with a lot of pastors. And I, and I do believe that in general, most pastors are, are are being very sincere in their beliefs. Now, the people that write these books and uh, make these movies and predict the end of the world when it doesn't happen, and then they write another book and make another movie, they're they're not sincere, clearly. But uh, um, I, I just, I wanted to take a look at those videos. And again, we looked first at a video by Glenn, Glenn Beck that talks about the Red Heifers, their role in bringing in the new temple. Um, there are other videos out there that talk about the blueprints are being made, the, the priests are getting ready. Uh, the solar eclipses. We looked at those. Uh, we looked at Jack Hibbs, who's, you know, the rapture is definitely one of the prominent um, understandings of a lot of believers in terms of something happening um, towards the end times. And there are lots of other things we could look at. Um, and I'm going to make a statement here that a lot of you watching, and, and thank you for, for letting you, uh, me know that you're here. Uh, let me let me go ahead and read um, just a couple of these comments. <laughs> this is a good friend of mine. Let me just make a plug. Um, Flaming Sword Apologetics. Not that others of you aren't good friends of mine. It just cracks me up because he said he wasn't going to be here. He lied. Uh, Flaming Sword Apologetics. Good friend, Darren Greg. We did a, a an apologetics podcast for a year. And now, shh, don't tell anyone, but we're starting to record some other episodes where we might be including some things about eschatology. And we'll let you know more about those. But you might want to check it out. Flaming Sword Apologetics. Um, Darren does a production on that and he's fantastic. All I do is just sit there and try to say stuff. Um, good morning from Brazil. Well, good morning to you, sir. Randall from Brazil. Um, <laughs> Pastor Jack's been left behind too, question mark. Um, oh, great. Uh, we've got, um, yeah, another uh, great guy here who has the new Cosmos video cast, which I would recommend. Um, specious speculation and fantastical fear-mongering. You should be a Baptist preacher. That's great alliteration there. Um, but again, what I'm going to say here, for, for a lot of you tuning in, this is not going to be surprising, but for some of you who are tuning in now, or like I mentioned earlier, I've got some friends that, that do not share my view of eschatology that said they're going to watch it later. And uh, for them especially, and, and some of you even that are watching now, this may be a little surprising. There is one thing that that all those people, I believe, have in common in those videos and if we watched a number of other videos and they're and they're out there i mean you know, there's a lot about the you know, ukraine russia war and that that's gog and magog um other things about signs in the in the heavens you know um 
people being ungodly. That's a sign of the end time. And we, we could go to a myriad of videos with all, all by people who are going to have far more views than I ever will. And I would say they all have something in common in their understanding of the end times. And here it is. And again, this might seem a little strong to some of you. Here it is. Two words. They're wrong. They're wrong. They're all wrong. And some of you might think, oh, because you think they're wrong, Joel? No, it honestly, it doesn't matter what I believe. When we study the Bible, it ultimately, it doesn't matter what I believe. Even some of you watching as much, and I know a lot of you personally, as much as I love you, it doesn't really matter what you believe. What matters is what did Jesus believe? What did Paul believe? What did Peter believe? What did Jude believe? What did Luke believe? What did Mark believe? What did Matthew believe? And we can know that we are not left in the dark. And so what I want to do now, and we may go back to, to, uh, to some more of those comments um, later. And it's just, it's just fantastic to have, to have you all tuning in. I, I appreciate it um, so, so much. But what we're going to do now, and again, this may be a little bit longer teaching than I do in other videos, but for the benefit of people that are that are just learning some of these things, I wanted to provide sort of an on-ramp to why I believe what I believe, why a lot of you believe what I believe. And so for some of you that already watch my channel, some of this is going to be repeat, but, but I think it's important because one of the things that I try to do on my channel is not only present content, but present it in such a way that it that you can duplicate that when you're talking to other people, because sometimes, sometimes it's hard to know how, how do I talk about these things? Because there is so much resistance from some people. I mean, look at the sign in the background, right? The end is near. How could it not be, even though now it's been near for a long, 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 long time. And so what I'm going to do is, is do is do some teaching here. And I'm going to share uh, you're going to be able to see these notes. There's a lot of scripture passages. There are some other things. So if you want to take screenshots of those, if you want to write down the passages of scripture, whatever you want to do, it's probably going to be about uh, 25 minutes or so. And um, so for those of you that are thinking 25 minutes, Joel, you know, you go get your cup of coffee and your breakfast and, and come back afterwards and we'll do a little Q&A. But I mean this to be very helpful for you. And I've really tried to, to make this as succinct as possible in, in, a, in a way that I think might be helpful um, to you. And so again, I'm going to share my screen here. And I'm going to put myself, let's see, there we go. Hey, that's actually what I wanted to do. How about that? So you should be able to see um, these notes here. And um, what I want to do before we go on is I'm just going to pray and ask for the Lord's help. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, first of all, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have made. And I thank you for these beautiful people that have joined in on this live stream and others that might join in yet this morning and others that will watch it in, in the following days, weeks, months, even years with this technology. Lord, I pray that many, 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 many people watch this, not because of me, but so that you might be glorified, so that saints might be edified, and for those that don't know your son, Jesus Christ, yet, so that they might get curious and want to learn more about uh, something that I think is, is incredibly important. So I pray that you will bless this time we're together, not only this teaching time, um, but also the Q&A time, and that we could just have some rich communion with Jesus and with one another. And we pray this in his mighty, matchless name. Amen. So just for fun, because I know some of you watch my channel. And uh, so we're going to pretend we're, we're, we're just uh, we're changing gears here. And I'm going to say, hello, everybody. Welcome one more time to the past days with Pastor Joel. Apparently, some of you get a kick out of that. And I do, too. And so... We move now to this teaching section. And the first thing I want to do, and again, this will be review for some of you, but I hope it's helpful, is um, I want to talk to you about how I understand the scriptures, how I interpret them. The big fancy Greek word for that is hermeneutic. And I think an easy way to think of hermeneutics is how do we get from then and there to here and now? In other words, how do we get 
from the original audience. So the letters to the Corinthians, how do we get to know them a little bit? How do we get to know their setting and culture? And that's the interpretation. Interpretation is always first, so important. Interpretation before application. Um, so often we go to a Bible study or we're talking to other believers and they say, what does that mean to you? What does that verse mean to you? What does that verse mean to you? What does that verse mean to you is not a bad question, but it's not the first question. The first question is what did it mean to the original audience and the original writer or the original speaker? Once we've done some work there, then we can understand the interpretation. There's always and only one correct interpretation of any passage. There aren't like 10 interpretations available. There's one correct one. Now, as far as how we can apply it to our lives today, that can be uh, many applications and varied applications. But one interpretation could be several applications, but interpretation is always before application. That's hermeneutics. Because I wear glasses, sometimes I think of it like this. What lenses am I looking through? when I'm searching the scriptures, because everyone has a set of lenses and sometimes we don't know that. And so the, the, you know, the first order of business is to really just acknowledge what lenses am I looking at the Bible with? Am I looking, you know, through my denomination, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Presbyterian, I'm a Lutheran, I'm a whatever, I'm an independent. Um, are we looking at it from, you know, this is what my family told, or this is what my ancestors, you know, we've always believed um, this. Are we looking at scriptures through a particular creed or set of beliefs, which 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 there may have a lot of value, but we need to do our very best to set all that aside and look at the scriptures as Bereans. Acts 17 and verse 11 says that the Bereans were commended more than the Thessalonians because when they were taught something, they went back to the scriptures daily to see if what they were being taught was true. And guess who that was in reference? Guess who the teacher was? It was like Paul and friends. It wasn't like some lightweight. And, and so even when Paul taught them, they're like, yeah, we, we're going to go back and check those scriptures to see if he was right. And so let me tell you that just be, before I actually get into my notes here, I'm already preaching. Look out. Um, don't take any of this because I've said it. Don't take any of this because it's my word. Take it because it's God's word if it is. Um, again, I, I'm just... I'm just some guy um, that, that loves the word of God. I, I'm just a student of the scripture. Um, so it doesn't really matter what I think, but it does matter what Jesus thinks. It matters what the apostles think, and it matters what the Old Testament prophets thought. And that essentially is my hermeneutic for interpreting all scripture. I start with Jesus, I go to the apostles, and then I go to the prophets. Um, now, they're all important because I believe God's word is inspired. But the reason I start with Jesus, really two reasons. Uh, in Luke 24, this amazing story often called the walk to Emmaus. And um, Jesus shows up and he tells these guys, you know, everything in what we call the Old Testament, you know, the, the Torah, the first five books, the writings, um, the prophets, all those things. Jesus said, hey, that was pointing to me. So if Jesus himself said that all of what we call the Old Testament is pointing to him, then he's in authority on all of that scripture. I'm um, also... I believe that Jesus did physically rise from the dead. And it's like, you know, if somebody does that, I'll go with what he says. And so that's why I start with Jesus. I then move to the apostles because the apostles many times in their writings said that we're not teaching anything but what the Old Testament prophets taught. Okay, we're not changing anything. We're not introducing new things. Let me just kill my phone here. And so... They also, of course, got their teachings from Jesus, including their teaching about the end time. So that's why I moved to the apostles, and then I moved to the Old Testament prophets. And if the Bible is really inspired, there should be perfect unity between what Jesus, the apostles, and the Old Testament prophets thought and taught. And there is, I believe. All right? And so I want to go a little bit to something that Peter said in Acts 2 and 3 that, that relates to this, this connection between uh, the teachings of the apostles and the prophets. And and I'll just quickly go over this story. It starts in Acts 2, about verse 14 or 15, I think. It's the event we know as Pentecost, where these tongues of fire came down, and Peter starts preaching. This is often considered the sermon that birthed the church. And one of the things Peter does is he starts quoting from everyone's favorite prophet, Joel. He's quoting from Joel 2, beginning in verse 28, where Joel is saying, in the last days, and then Joel says certain things 
are going to happen. The spirit would be poured out. People would be given visions and dreams. And Peter is saying to his audience right there in the first century, hey, 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 look, this is that. What Joel talked about is happening right now. It's amazing. And, and Peter goes on and he kind of traces a little bit of Israel's history. And then he says something amazing. This is Acts 3 and verse 24. Again, write these scriptures down or take screenshots. Peter in Acts 3 verse 24 said, And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him proclaimed these days. What, these days now in America, 21st century, or, or Brazil, or wherever people are watching from, Canada? No. His Days. This is so crucial, not only in prophecy, but perhaps especially in prophecy. And you'll know this term, audience relevance. Who was being spoken to? Who was being written to? What would they understand by what they were being taught? We need to get to the original audience again to understand the correct interpretation. So Peter is saying, all the prophets who had spoken from Samuel and those came after him were talking about these days that were happening right then in the early church. It's an amazing statement. Now, Peter didn't say that that's all the prophets talked about. You can go back to the Old Testament prophets, and there were lots of other judgments. A lot of times they were saying, Israel, shape up. They were saying other things too, but all of them, according to Peter, it doesn't matter what I think, doesn't matter what you think. According to Peter, all the prophets spoke about the events happening right in front of their very eyes some 2,000 years ago. Amazing. Amazing. Doesn't that just change how we look at the scripture? Well, let's look at something that Paul said. We find this in 1 Corinthians 10. And, and just to give you a little bit of context, Paul has been talking about the nation of Israel and how they constantly were moving away from Yahweh and what he wanted them to do. And then Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11. Now, these things happened to them, to Israel, as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, check this out, on whom the end of the ages has come. Paul believed, again, I, I am firmly convinced from, from my head to my toes that we can know what Jesus believed about the timing of the end times what Paul believed about the timing of the end times, what Peter believed, because these statements, how much clearer could Paul be? Paul was saying that right then, sometimes I say, you know, them there that were there then, he's saying to those very people that the end of the ages had come in their time. Now, what you do with that is up to you, but that is what Paul said. And notice that Paul and Peter are in perfect accord. And a careful reading of the New Testament will reveal statement after statement like these. The first century apostles and their generation expected something to happen in their time. There was a sense of imminence, urgency, even in their writings. And they said that they were what they were speaking of was the same thing the Old Testament prophets wrote and spoke of and the same thing Jesus had taught. When you go, for instance, to uh, to Romans 8, and Paul's talking about the, the creation groaning and so on. And then he says, the sons of God will be revealed. He, he uses the word that's translated often eagerly in English. That word eagerly, the original Greek is like outstretched neck on their tippy toes. These people were waiting for something. And do you see what we have done? A, a lot of the church is in a time capsule. And we're trying to live in the way that only one generation was asked to live. No wonder it doesn't work very well. They were literally, they believed. Again, it doesn't matter what I believe. Sorry, it doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what Jack Hibbs believes or any of these people. It matters what Jesus believed, what Paul believed, what Peter believed, what the writers of the Gospels believed. And they said things were going to happen soon. They were at hand. They were at the door. They were coming quickly. We see these time statements all throughout the New Testament writings. The most common number I've encountered is that there are 101 such statements. There are also 318 direct or indirect, indirect references to Christ's parousia or second appearing. Um, we don't actually see the term second coming in the New Testament. I, I think it's fine to use that term, but, but, but really it's second appearing, and we see that in Hebrews 9.28. 
Now, what I'm about to say, not for many of you watching, but for some of you watching now or later, may be shocking because it was to me when I first considered it. Fantastic. we got more people joining in. As I continued to study these things, pray, read, have multiple conversations with people from a variety of eschatological persuasions, I came to this surprising conclusion. Listen carefully. Well, the New Testament, certainly the old, but I'm just focusing on the new now because that's where most Christians come into the faith. Well, the New Testament often speaks of the end of the age. It never speaks of the end of the world. Now, one of the reasons so many of us have thought that it speaks of the end of the world was because of, um, this just popped in my head, I'm a pretty big Van Halen fan, and on their album Diver Down, there was this tune called Top Jimmy. Great little tune. Um, this is not Top Jimmy, but sometimes I call it King Jimmy, and I mean no disrespect, but King Jimmy is the King James version. In a few places, it mistranslated the Greek term Aeon, which means age, as world. Most notably in Matthew 24, verse 3, that's when the uh, some of the apostles came, uh, uh, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, I believe, and they came and asked Jesus, you know, Jesus had just made this prophecy about the temple falling and not one stone will be left upon another and so on. And they're like, when is this going to happen? When is the end of the age? You know, when are you coming? And so forth. And, and it's translated there that they're asking about the end of the world. They did not ask Jesus about the end of the world. They weren't thinking about the end of the world. It never entered their minds. They were saying, when is the end of the age? When is your, your new age that you've spoken to us about and taught us about over and over and the new, the new covenant? When is that coming in? And it was mistranslated as world, and it has messed all kinds of things up. Because for quite a while, I mean, now we've got, what, you know, 6,700 different Bible translations, you know, like the the teen Bible for people with epilepsy. I mean, that's a weird example, but I mean, there's just, there's just so many different Bibles. It's like, just pick one and just read it, you know, but, but for a while um, people were primarily using only the King James Bible and it's got some really bad translations. And so um, this timing is important. Now, now some people claim the timing statements like soon quickly at hand, the judges at the door, they'll say, well, you know what? God lives outside of time. Or they'll say, well, with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day. Now, those arguments can be easily debunked, and I'm not going to do that in depth. But I want to say a couple things that should be glaringly obvious if we're honest with ourselves and honest with the text. If time doesn't matter to God, why are there so many stinking time statements given throughout the entirety of Scripture? Just for fun. Secondly, God is not the author of confusion. He communicates to humans largely through the writings of other humans in ways that are typically easy to understand he's not trying to trick us. Now, let's kind of go through my hermeneutic here. Jesus, the apostles, Old Testament, prophets. Some things are going to overlap, but let's look at some things Jesus said. I want to give you these, these chapters first. Again, a lot of you are already familiar with this, but um, Jesus did hit the majority of his prophetic teaching in what is often referred to as the Olivet Discourse. Matthew 24, and you can include 25, Mark 13, Luke 21, and some of Luke 17, and also throughout scattered throughout many of Jesus' parables. But Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13, Luke 21, some of 17. Jesus said some remarkable things. So Matthew 24, 34, Mark 13, 30, and Luke 21, 32, Jesus limited the events of the eschaton, the end times, to this generation. Not 21st century America, Brazil, Canada, wherever you're tuning in from. Not us. The people there right in front of him who he was talking to. How do we know that? Because what do people say? No, Jesus was actually saying when these things happen, that generation, or some people think generation, actually, he was saying race. How do we how do we know that what I'm saying is right? And, and they're wrong. We use scripture to interpret scripture, and we go to other passages where those same words are used. And when we do that, and this is just you know, like hermeneutics 101. It's like, 
interestingly, even people that have very, very different views than I do, when I look at their books on hermeneutics, they basically all say the same thing. Just a lot of them don't do it. Right? And so when we look at all these other places that the Greek term genia is translated as a generation, we see that in every single instance without exception, throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it always and only refers to that particular group of people. Okay? Another factor um, that's often overlooked is that the Bible is talking about, you know, we read things like a perverse generation, a wicked generation, a crooked generation, a wayward generation. We think, oh, that's just like all everybody who's wicked and bad, or that's us now. No. No, no, I'm not saying that's not true. I mean, some of you even watching this morning, you may be incredibly wicked. I, I hope not. But there was this one particular generation, and we'll go into this more other times. It was predicted way back in Deuteronomy, particularly in chapters 28 through 32 and in there, that was going to be this last generation of the nation of Israel. When we enter the New Testament scene, that's who John the Baptist is talking to. That's who he's warning. That's who Jesus is warning. There was a particular generation, the last generation of old covenant Israel. They were the wicked, perverse, crooked, wayward, evil generation. Did he not even say to some of the Pharisees, your father is the devil? Okay, and so that's often overlooked that, that there was a particular generation. And pardon the crudeness of this illustration, but if... You know, a lot of you have kids watching. I have kids. If our kids did horrible, horrible, horrible things and we knew it was them who did it, would it really make sense to spank their great, 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 great grandchildren instead? But that's what a lot of the church believes. Um, Jesus in Matthew 23 is saying to these people, those people of that generation, all this judgment was going to come up on them for specific things because they were responsible for the blood of the prophets all the way back to Abel. They were the only generation that did that. Are you responsible for the blood of the prophets? Are you responsible for having Jesus crucified? Now, some of you would, would say, I think based upon kind of a misunderstanding of Isaiah 53, uh, these there for all, all, we've all done that. No, no, there were a particular group of people that Jesus himself said, you are responsible. You're responsible for the blood of all the prophets. And he, you, and he knew that they were going to have him crucified. And he also knew that many of his apostles and disciples were going to be martyred for their faith. And that there's only one generation that, that fits the bill. And that was them there that were there then. Okay. So now I'm having fun. I hope you're having, I hope you're having fun too. Um, now we're going to look at some specific things that Jesus said and work with this hermeneutic. Again, let's start with Jesus. What were Jesus' beliefs about the events of the end times and particularly his coming? Matthew 16, 27 to 28. It's Jesus speaking. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. Then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, important word, you, not me, you, them, you. There are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Here's Mark's version. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, again, he's speaking to one specific generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels, saying the, the same things that, that Matthew records. And then he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. I don't think anyone would doubt that these are passages about the second coming or appearing of Christ. The question is, when did Jesus believe it was to take place? And again, I can't overemphasize this. It doesn't matter when Joel thinks it was supposed to take place. Any of you watching, people watching later, doesn't matter what Amir Safadi or however you pronounce his name thinks about it. Jane Merkel, John MacArthur. The question is, when did Jesus believe it was to take place? He said there are some standing here, the people he was speaking to, who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Mark expands that a little bit to say the kingdom that has come with power. How do you get around that? How do you wiggle out of that? And why would we want 
to. And Jesus says something so clear. Why would we want to sort of hijack what he said and apply it to people thousands of years later? Do we not trust him? Do we not believe him? What I was taught about that initially is that Jesus was referring to an event called the Mount of Transfiguration. Some people believe he was referring to Pentecost. I'm going to tell you five things that make that position absolutely false, erroneous, and untenable. One, there is no indication in the Mount of Transfiguration event that angels were present, but Jesus said they would be present. Two, there's no indication of the Mount of Transfiguration event that Jesus came in the glory of the Father, but Jesus said he would come in the glory of the Father. Three, there's no indication in the Mount of Transfiguration event that any judgment took place, but Jesus said judgment would take place. Four, there is no indication in the Mount of Transfiguration event that the kingdom came with power. Five, and perhaps the most damaging element that proves these passages cannot be referring to the Mount of Transfiguration event or Pentecost, because Jesus said there are some standing here who will not taste death before these things happen. Do you know that the Mount of Transfiguration happened about a week later? And Pentecost happened, what, just 50 days after his ascension? What are the chances that most of the audience Jesus was speaking to would be dead in a week or a month and a half? Really? Now that I began looking more at these passages from the lips of Jesus himself, it became clear that he believed he would return to that generation in the first century. Now I have a choice whether or not I believe Jesus, but I do not have the, the option to say, well, he didn't believe that because he did. It is so clear. How much clearer could he have been? And here's here's something really, really interesting. Um, learn this from Dr. Kelly Nelson Burks, who unfortunately had an early death. I would highly recommend to you, if you go online, um, look up Dr. Kelly Nelson Burks, Second Coming Series. Dr. Kelly Nelson Burks, Second Coming Series. And he's got a series of YouTube videos that he did on it just not too long before he before he died. And I learned a lot from him. But one of the things he said is that when we look at the different events of the end times, and there are really four. There's Jesus' second appearing. There's some kind of judgment. There is language about you know cosmic disturbances in the heavens. And there's resurrection. When we see those, here's what Dr. Kelly Nelson Burke said. And I think he's right. There are sometimes when those events are listed, sometimes in isolation, sometimes they overlap. There are sometimes when those are mentioned in the New Testament when there is no time statement given. But, and this is so powerful, every single time, every stinking time without exception, when there is a time statement given, it only and always can apply to the, the first century. It's boundaried there. Every single time, it's almost like the writers of scripture all believe the same thing. Now, C.S. Lewis, who I've read a lot of C.S. Lewis, and maybe some of you have as well. Very famous Christian thinker, philosopher, author of the 20th century. C.S. Lewis stated that Matthew 24, 34, that's where Jesus said, all these things will take place before this generation. Now, C.S. Lewis realized that Jesus was talking about that generation there, but C.S. Lewis said, that's the most embarrassing verse in the Bible. Now, before we get too harsh with C.S. Lewis, why did he say that? Because he understood that Jesus thought he was going to return then. And according to C.S. Lewis, he didn't. So C.S. Lewis said that's the most embarrassing verse in the Bible. According to Lewis, Jesus was simply wrong about the timing of his second coming. Now, it's understandable to me if Christians sometimes get things wrong whether it be the timing of the last days or anything else. But there's a big difference between uninspired believers getting the timing wrong and the inspired writers of scripture getting the timing wrong, much less Jesus himself. Now, I've got quite a few verses here and I would encourage you, write them down, take a screenshot, because I'm not gonna go over all of them, but I'm gonna go over some of them. These are taken generally from the most literal word to word Bible translations. There's a really important word. A lot of you know this, and we'll probably talk about this more in another case, but the Greek term is, is mellow or different derivations of that. And it, it usually often means about to or is about to be. And it was interestingly left out of a lot of translations, but the literal word for word translations include it. Luke 3, 7, this is John the Baptist. Who warned you? 
not me, them. Who warned you to flee from the wrath about to come? Is the correct translation. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. His winnowing fork, he's talking about Jesus. His winnowing fork is in his hand. Is Jesus been like, like waiting for some 2,000 years now to take his pitchfork and whatever you do with pitchfork? Jesus himself, Luke 21, 22. These are the days of vengeance in order that all things which are written may be fulfilled. And there's almost universal agreement in the scholarship that this is in reference to the soon coming destruction of Jerusalem. At that time, Jesus said it. That that's what he was saying, that when this happens, all things written will be fulfilled. Let's go to Acts 17, 31. Again, I'm not going to go over all these. I hope you wrote them down or took some pictures. He, Jesus, has fixed a day in which he is about to judge. That's the correct translation, the world in righteousness. Acts 24, 15. Here's one to uh, rock your world a little bit. There is about to be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Okay, Paul in Romans 13, 11, and 12. It is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. Me, you, know them, you. For now, salvation is near to us. Then when we believe the night is almost gone, the day is at hand. Is the night that was almost gone 2,000 years ago still here today? Wow. Now, this is interesting. We go to 2 Timothy. We see in the last days, and a lot of people say this, um, in the last days, you know, there are going to be lovers of self, lovers of money, people living ungodly, and so forth. And granted, we have all these things. I'm not saying we don't, but I'm saying that's not what Paul is talking about. In the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, he goes on. Then he says, avoid these men. Now, let me ask what to me now is, is a powerful, but kind of an obvious question. Why would Paul and why would these other writers of scripture be warning people and saying, watch out for these men, if actually the men they were supposed to watch out for weren't going to be alive for some 2,000 years? Makes zero sense. Zilch goose egg. Okay, let's go on. Ephesians 1.21, not only in this age, but also in the one about to come. 1 Thessalonians 4, perhaps the most well-known so-called rapture text. We who are alive, not talking about me, them there that were there then. We who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. We shall be caught up together with them. They were also comforted. Once in chapter 4, once in chapter 5, Paul said, comfort one another with these words. Now, why would Paul have told the Thessalonians to comfort one another with things that were actually supposed to be about us? But isn't that fun and tempting to think that we might be the last generation? No idea why I said it like that. It happens. Hebrews. Now, here's an interesting passage. I, I just have the end of it here, but it talks about, do not forsake the assembling together. Um, but but meet on a regular basis and so forth. And how often pastors, and I confess I've done this, guilted it over their congregations. The Bible says you got to meet together. you got to meet. Now, I'm not opposed to meeting together. I'm still part of a local church, and I, I believe in, in finding local, local fellowship with other believers if there's any way that you can do that. But the end of that says, especially as you see the day drawing near. Huh. Hebrews 10, 27, the fury of a fire, which is about to consume the adversaries. And here is... There are some verses, I call them slam dunk verses, like there is no wiggle room here. This is so crystal clear. Hebrews 10, 37, for yet a little while, he, talking about Jesus, who is coming, will come and will not delay. Now, if you can somehow stretch that into 2000 years and sleep well at night in your conscience, I, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I guess good. I don't even want to say good for you. It's not good for you. <laughs> it's not what it says. The Greek is even more emphatic in a very, very little while. You could even translate that. James 5, 7, be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. 5, 8, you too be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand, uh, even though it's not going to take place for thousands of years. 1 Peter 4, 5, they shall give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. In another slam dunk verse from Peter, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be of sound judgment. 4.17, for it is time for judgment to begin. 
John 2, 8, the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Gee, that sounds remarkably like what Paul said about the night coming to a close and the day arriving. Now, I want to challenge you on something. And I know a lot of you watching um, see things similarly to the way I do because I'm, I'm very privileged and blessed to know you and I, and I love you. And I mean that very sincerely. But some might not be. And you have friends, family members. Some of you have tried to be a part of churches. And so you all know people that will acknowledge that the end times, sure enough, began in the life of Jesus and the apostles. There are some people that will not acknowledge that. And I'm sorry, that is just plain dishonest. That is plain dishonest. That is pride, in my opinion, in my experience. But many Christians will acknowledge, okay, the end times began, and this is what I believe for a while, the end times began in the life of Jesus and the apostles. So clear. Again, that they believe that. But we're still in them now. But think of the end of the song. Is the end of the song super long or is it the end? If you're writing a paper, it, is the end like most of the paper or is it just like the end? Um, if you're standing at the end of a line, you're at the end. So the end is usually a fairly short period of time, right? But let's just say we could stretch that out and say the end times have lasted thousands of years now. And who knows how much longer they'll last. You know, you can if you would like if you would like to get out your end times rubber band and just, just stretch that baby out, you can do that. But what about what John said? First John 2:18. It is the last hour. Can you really stretch out something with that much eminence for two? thousand years and counting honestly i can't and then john goes on to say even now again in his now many antichrists have arisen and he says that's evidence that they were in the last hour and yet we've got so much of the church waiting for this this one you know half human half cyborg now half AI half demonically possess a lot of halves. It's a really odd looking creature. And we're waiting for the Bible knows nothing about anything like that. And then what's funny, it's not funny really, it's sad, but most of the sermons I've heard about Antichrist are preached from Revelation. Do you know how many times Antichrist is mentioned in Revelation? Yes, you can conflate the idea of the beast and smash it all together if you want to. But here's the interesting thing. There is universal agreement, as far as I know, among the scholarship, that the same John who wrote Revelation also wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Did he forget that he could have used the word Antichrist in Revelation? Because he used it here. Why didn't he use it there? It is the last hour. Even now, many Antichrists have arisen from this. We know that it is the last hour, in case you missed it. So, let me wrap up this teaching, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit. I hope, I hope you'll stay on. Um, gone a bit longer than with the teaching than I planned. But again, I wanted to make an on-ramp. I wanted to kind of set, um, let you know, kind of see how I'm thinking about these things so that when we go on another live stream, you'll have a context for that. And then you can kind of decide, yeah, I'm interested in that. Or some of you might think, Why? I'm not interested in that. And that's, that's your prerogative. But I wanted to let you know how I thought about it. So Glenn Beck and his guest believed that a new temple would be built. The plans were underway and the red heifers would be part of ushering in the last days because they were an important sacrifice in the Old Testament. Jimmy Evans and his guest believe the upcoming solar eclipse and other eclipses loom large in terms of the last days and that apparently America has a unique and special role. Gee, where have we heard that before? The ridiculous idea that America is Babylon or that New York City is Babylon. Um, yeah, I must have cut something out. Uh, things that never would have, oh, things that never would have entered the mind of John, never. He was not thinking of the United States, sorry. Amir, Safadi believes the new temple is coming. Didn't watch his clip, but he basically says all the same stuff all the time. Animal sacrifices. Animal sacrifices, by the way, that would be an affront to Christ's perfect once for all sacrifice. Did he not do enough? Should we really put the Bible in reverse and get back to the old covenant? Even though the entire book of Hebrews screams, the new covenant Jesus brought and taught was superior in every way. Jack Hibbs wants to give everyone flash drives who doesn't get sucked buck naked up into outer space. Why are they naked? 
Even though it's crystal clear that it was the first century church Paul said would experience this event, an event which likely was much different than the way we've envisioned it in our time. So here's a question I want to ask all of you, and then we're going to do a little Q&A and, and have some fun together. Could we believe Glenn, Jimmy, Amir, Jack, John, Benny, Jerry, Harry, Larry? Should we believe all these so-called modern-day prophets who have one thing in common? They've all been wrong with a capital wrong, and they will all continue to be wrong, 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 wrong. I've had some financial struggles lately. I was thinking of starting like a like some kind of a rapture bet, like uh, like betting people. Hey, the rapture is not going to happen. It's not going to happen by 2025, not going to happen by 2030. But then I was thinking, it's like, so could I bet people, I bet you a thousand bucks that the rapture won't happen. Well, when we get to those times, you know, I don't, I don't know that I'm going to be able to collect that. Um, so I don't know if anybody would go for that bet, but I, I think it might be a good way for me to make a little money. It simply is not going to happen. Whatever the rapture event was, whatever it meant, it's something that is a past event. So, should we believe all these false prophets? By the way, the Bible has some really, really strong things to say about false prophets. You aware of that? Should we believe instead something really radical and simply believe Jesus, the apostles, and the Old Testament prophets? For my money, it's never a bad thing to bet on Jesus. That's what I've chosen to do. Be forewarned, you might lose a lot in this life, and you might be surprised at how your family members or even close friends will respond. You might get kicked out of churches. But in the end, you will gain everything, not only in the life to come, but in this life too. After all, doesn't the Bible say something about us having every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ? Now, if what I've shared to you is completely new to you, and it will be for some people, please don't take my word for it. Take God's. Go back and look up these scriptures yourself. You can watch this again later so you can write them down. If what I've shared is not completely new, but you needed some review, I'm happy for you. And if you've already seen these glorious truths, then rejoice in what our mighty and matchless Savior Jesus has already accomplished on our behalf. We do not need to wait and be in his presence. We already are. We don't need to wait for him to defeat death. He already has. We don't need to look longingly and sometimes sadly thinking, Wayne, when is Jesus going to come? Because according to him, according to the apostles, according to the Old Testament prophets, he already did. Glory, glory, glory. So much more that can be said and that will be said over time. Many scriptures I've left out, but I hope this at the very least causes you to re-examine the Bible in terms of its end time teaching. And at the very most, causes you to fall on your knees and worship Jesus as never before, understanding he's already accomplished far more than any of us may have ever imagined. I feel like we should pass an offering plate now. No, we won't do that. So uh, what I am going to do here is take this away, if I can, um, get out of screen sharing that. Um, let me see. I got to figure out how to go back here and uh, I'll do it this way for now. No, it still didn't go away here, did it? Um, how do I? Okay, there we go. So thanks. That, that went a little longer than, than intended. Um, as far as the teaching. But again, I, I thought for the first time, I wanted you to know where I was coming from. Now, I've got um, 30 to 40 minutes left. And um, any of you that would like to stay on, I would love that. Let me see who's joined us, who maybe I haven't seen yet. <laughs> the, the bearded man, the bearded man, Drenalin, <laughs> um, says, can I get an email of that verse list? Yes. Um, here, Let me do it this way. Um, So you might need to write this down or put it on your phone or something. What I will do is share my email and any of you that would want, I think that's the easiest way to do it. Any of you that want a list of those scriptures, email me. Just say, watch your live stream. Please send me the scriptures and I will. Um, there's other places you can get them online and stuff too, but more than that too, but I'll, I'll do that. So my email is J-O-E-L dot R-O-S as in Sam, E-N as in Nancy, A-U-E-R. 
R O S as in Sam, E N as in Nancy, A U E R at gmail.com. Joel.rosenauer. It sounds a lot easier than it spells. I, I just used to tell people I rose an hour early this morning. That's how people remember my last name. Joel.rosenauer at gmail.com. If you want a list of those scriptures, if you want all the notes. Um, and I also um, just have a lot of resources, um, different websites um, that I can send you to if you want to learn more about this, this content. Um, so you can do that. Thank you. Um, Kelly, a really enjoy your teaching. Make things clear. Thank you so much. Jesus was the final sacrifice. Why would we go back to Egypt? Yeah, great question. Um, oh, we got another subscriber on the flaming sword too, which is which is cool. Um, Joel, we were first pointed to you in the fall of 2022 when you were in your series Prophet Land. We've been predators for over 20 years, but we were loving your walk through. Um, this foundation look forward to how you're going to continue building on it. Do I have plans to continue that series? So yeah, my, <laughs> I had lots of plans and they got, they got cut, cut short. Um, so I, I do hope to con continue with those messages in whatever way the Lord allows me to do. I would believe me. I, I loved being in, in full-time vocational ministry. I always say vocational ministry because my belief is that every Christian is in full-time ministry, regardless, regardless what you do for your voc vocation. But I would love to be in a role like that again. And, and the Lord may grant that at some time. I don't know. Um, but in the meantime, this is a great way um, to do it. Um, oh, um, Scott Brandon must be must be here because I see we listen to you too, Scott Brandon. Just haven't seen him yet. Let's go back over to the top here. He might have been on early. Um, got some others here. Um, yeah, this is, this is lots of fun. Um, others who have joined in, which is great. Please... Um, you know, tell your friends about about this live stream as well. And um, if you um, haven't yet already, I would sure love it if you would like the channel, subscribe. I'm up to like 506 subscribers when I started this. I mean, I thought, man, if I had 100, that would be cool. But I really do, as well as my other uh, work, and I have been very blessed to get some other work lately. Um, but I do want to make this you know part of my ministry over time. I've got, you know, if the, if the Lord... You know, Lord willing, I've got some big, big plans, and this is a huge part of my life. I would like to even, you know, be involved with, you know, really expanding my YouTube channel, um, doing some travel and some teaching. Um, more than open to doing debates with people, either online um, or in person. And so, just know that, and please pray for direction on that, because that that really is my heart. I I uh, I want to, you know, um, I've always loved Jesus and teaching the Bible. But this has been such a such an amazing thing in my life to come to these understandings, and I want to make it a huge part of the rest of my life. So please, please pray for direction. I don't have a way right now for anybody to support the ministry, but I'm working on that too for people who might who might want to. So let's do this. Um, any um any questions? It could be something from one of the videos. It could be something um, that I taught. Um, clarifications. Go ahead and put those in the in the chat, and I will answer them the best I can. Again, I've got like about um. 30, 35, 35 minutes to do that. Um, is this a helpful thing? Um, I thought about doing it maybe starting once a month. Is it is it something you'd watch? Is it worth your time? Again, other times I might not teach uh, quite as much, but it's important to get that teaching out there too. But are, do you have any questions? Question, generational curses. It's nice to to start with a really easy one like that. I, I think that's you're probably referring to when you go back in certain places in the Old Testament and it seemingly says that if someone has some type of a curse or a sickness or sin, that that was automatically going to continue um, in those other generations. The way I really see that, and and I would say I have a little bit of a, a different understanding of that in the, the, in the New Covenant and the Old Covenant potentially too, but I would see it more today like um, I don't think that anybody is punished because of anyone else's sin. And, and that's also communicated in the Old Testament. It seems pretty clear that a person is responsible for their own sin. But yet there were consequences, sometimes grave consequences. Think of, of Achan's sin, where his whole family, you know, ends up um, not going out too well. <laughs> and so, uh, and I think of it kind of like that. Like, let's take a situation today that would be kind of an obvious one, but let's say there's a father of a family who's an alcoholic um, I don't think that means it's going to guarantee that, you know, his sons or daughters are going to be alcoholics. 
but it does mean that his sin is potentially going to affect the family for generations. So it's not that that those other people, you know, have those same things happen to them because of the father's sin, but but we all live out the consequences of one another's sin. And the more drastic those sins are, um, the the more difficult those consequences are going to be. So that's how that's how I see that. Okay. Ray says we would definitely watch. Awesome. Um, and the person who asked about generational sin says, I have friends that believe they need to be cleansed from the sins of their father. Yeah. And that's, you know, unfortunately, some people believe that and it can get, it can get wacky. I mean, this is more on the fringe, but I actually have a, a friend, uh, a couple friends who, who, you know, they know people that, that are caught up in, it's almost like where the Bible becomes a book of incantations, you know, and you've almost got to cast off these spells and, you know, you get in a car accident and you, that was some type of a curse from something. I mean, it just, it just gets crazy. Like the Bible is not some magic abracadabra book for crying out loud. And so I just, with a friend like that, I would just, I would just pray for them. If they have openness to talk about these things, I, I would challenge them nicely. Uh, questions are good because questions um, tend to make people less defensive than statements. You might say, oh, um, so you're saying you think you need to, be, need to be cleansed from the sins of your father. What what led you to that conclusion? And why do you think that? Oh, that's interesting. Could we could we sit down and look at those scriptures together? And and that might be a way for them to begin asking themselves where they got that belief. And I found when when people start questioning their own belief, it's usually more effective than when you start questioning their belief. Um, here's somebody. Yeah, I can relate to this. When I when I came to embrace preterism, this is from Randall. I had the thought that perhaps salvation was only for Israel. Then I came across I.O. For those of you that don't know those definitions, Israel only teachings uh, kind of scared me at first. How would you refute I.O.? Yeah, well, the first thing I might do is I might suggest some resources. Um, this is a great resource for many, many really good articles from a man named Charles Meek. Charles is a good friend of mine. Um, prophecyquestions.com prophecyquestions.com and um, there you can pull up, you know, there are different things you can hit on because he teaches about more than just end times, but it's, it's either eschatology or end times teaching, that type of thing. He has some really good information on IO. Um, Pastor David Curtis from Berean Bible Church has also done a couple of messages refuting IO, Berean Bible Church, I think it's .com, and then they have a studies section, and you click on those studies and, and um I don't know what those particular messages were called. I'm sorry, but you might be able to find it. Tom Mills, M-I-L-L-S, has some good YouTube videos on refuting I.O. And any of those things uh, would do a better job than I can just do right at the moment on the top of my head. But the, the main thing I would say is that there's so many times in Scripture when it makes a clear delineation from between Israel and the nations. And for I.O. to be true, those other nations actually have to be Israel as well. And that's just... Whack nut. Um, let's see. Um, all right. Um, Pastor Joel, do you believe it's still in covenant boundary or towards the planet? I don't understand the question. Um, if you can clarify that for me, do you believe it's still covenant boundary or towards the planet? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Um, but if you can clarify it, I'll, I'll give it a bit. I shot. Okay, some other people that said they would watch, um, which is just awesome. Um, anybody else have any questions? It can be about end times. It can be about um, other things in the Bible. Um, well, I'm thinking about that. Let me give you another resource. And I know most of you watching already know this term. Um, what I believe um, is generally known as the uh, as preterism. It's not my favorite word. Um, other people believe what I believe. It's it's none of our favorite word. It just I part of it's just a sound. I think it sounds too much like predator, like a preterist is going to come get you. Also, a lot of times what will happen is you'll mention I'm a preterist. People will go online and and look up oh what's what's preterism and get all kinds of different ideas instead of asking you what you believe. And so I'm just saying that to. I think it's wise sometimes to avoid that term in conversations where other people understand it. It's fine. The reason I mentioned that is there's another website. It's, it's just, there's, I don't agree with all of it and that's okay, but it's called preterist papers, all one word preteristpapers.com 
has some really short videos. And then there's a, there's a little paper, Las Predators papers that goes along with those. And those papers just for your own personal Bible study, they're loaded with scripture. And those would be another fantastic resource. Um, okay. I missed another question. Do I believe the gifts, <laughs> the gifts are still alive? And if so, what scripture would support that? Man, this is a, you know, within fulfilled eschatology, AKA preterism, this is kind of one of the big issues. Um, what do we do with spiritual gifts? The, the first thing I would say um, is that the word charismatic is misunderstood. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul mentions the charismata, which unfortunately was is usually translated spiritual gifts, when really a better way to translate would be to say the spirituals. So my understanding, just based on that word, is every Christian is charismatic and has gifts. Um, and it's unfortunate that's not misunderstood. The, the problem is that, that sometimes when people are talking about spiritual gifts, they're talking past one another because they have not defined their terms. For instance, there are Christians that are cessationists. And what cessationists believe are that the spiritual gifts, again, misunderstanding of, of that term charismata, cessationists believe that all those gifts are past. But have you ever met a cessationist that would say that God would never heal anybody? Because I haven't. So they'll still say, well, yeah, God still might do that or he might. Work. So so they do sort of still believe in them, but they're, they're not understanding each other. And then you have people that, that are saying the gifts are just active in the way they used to be. And so here, here is where I stand. I believe that if God wants to, he can certainly still he, heal people. I believe God works powerfully through certain Bible teachers. I believe some people have gifts of what we still might call evangelism, um, telling, um, telling um, people about Jesus in ways that they seem to have more effect than other people. I believe that God might choose to heal through some people, I, I believe there are times, and, and we need to uh, be discerning about this, but when people might get what what we call a word from the Lord, you know, I, the other day I sensed that God was saying something with me, and I, I just feel like I should share it with you. I think we should always be careful, not dogmatic, not prideful with that language. Um, so I believe all those things still happen. I believe the Spirit of God is still very active in our lives, but... I believe that when we go to the New Testament and they were talking about these certain gifts, they were talking about gifts that were uniquely to be a part of that approximately 40 year period, often known as the eschaton or the second exodus. And in that time, the, the gifts were manifested in amazing ways that I do not believe we see today. So I think there was a special place and a special role in the Holy Spirit working through miraculous gifts during that period of time in order to demonstrate that, hey, this is Jesus. This is your Messiah. He has come. And I think that um, we do not see those types of gifts today, but that's much different than saying that the gifts are not active in any way today. So I hope that uh, that can clear, clear things up a little bit. Um, new listener, I uh, just found you about a week ago. I've been watching this grow for the past six years. Yeah, no, no question um, about um, about um, about that. And I, I want to get back to that in just a second. But let me go here. Somebody's saying, can I please get an email of that verse list you're reading off of? So let me give this one more time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give my email address out. And anybody that wants those verses, email me. Say, I watched the live stream. Please give me those verses. And then I'll get it to you. So my, my email again is J-O-E-L dot. R-O-S as in Sam, E-N-A-U-E-R at gmail.com. J-O-E-L dot R-O-S-E-N-A-U-E-R at gmail.com. Just say, I watched your live stream, send me the verses, and I'll get those to you. Um, so going back to <laughs> um, the question, somebody sees this growing. Let me tell you about something really cool. You might, you might check this out. Um, a, a friend of mine, good friend of mine, uh, John Paul Miles, who shares this view, let me know about this just a week and a half ago. And, and since then, a couple of you have said you, you've already watched this lady's podcast. There's a podcast called There's No Place Like Home. The lady who hosts it is named Shelly something. I don't know her last name. There's No Place Like Home. She has over 74,000 subscribers. 
and she's starting to talk about preterism. She's studying it right now. She's saying, you know, I, I have a lot to learn, but the, but just a couple of days ago, um, she did an episode and I listened to part of that. And a few days ago, she did as well. So just uh, go to There's No Place Like Home, that podcast. But what a great thing, even if even if some people you know don't agree, just to have, you know, potentially tens of thousands of people hear about a perspective that they've never even heard about. And the way she presents it is is fair. Like she'll say so far, I I, I don't really not really understanding some of the full preterist paradigm, but but I'm open to it. And they've got some strong scripture. And it's just, oh, I mean, just not to be called heretics and have things thrown at us is is really refreshing. So I'm appreciative of that podcast. Um, I know that uh, some of you will know the name Don Preston. Don just announced recently that he's got a debate coming up in October of this year. And he said he wasn't going to give the name out, but the person he's debating, I think it's an atheist who basically said, hey, Jesus failed. That's the way Don was presenting it. This guy's saying Jesus failed because he could see that Jesus believed he was going to come before and he didn't. And But Don said this is a very well-known scholar and, and Don feels like this is going to be another opportunity to get this message out. So it is definitely growing. Uh, Got to run. Thank you for a great podcast, Brother Joel. Thank you, Randall. Really appreciate your kind words. And I know this is getting, you know, a little lengthy maybe, but uh, but it's great to have this dialogue. Any more um any more questions that you have, either about eschatology or anything else? Yeah. Um, Kenny says, imagine World War One or World War II times. Many of these people would think it was the end of times. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and it kind of makes it makes sense um, if you're not, if you don't have a really strong biblical foundation of this. Like, like, things are really bad right now. I mean, this has got to be the end. Well, let me give you another resource. Um, the author is Francis Gummerlock, G-U-M-M-E-R-L-O-C-K, I believe. Francis Gummerlock. I think the book is just called The Last Hour, almost positive. And he is basically documented, I mean, from, you know, basically from the inception of the church until now, how many different events people thought, you know, where people thought we're in the end times now. And there's a lot of them. And, and it's just, and sometimes people don't know that, you know, it's like, Pretty much every generation has believed that they were going to be the last generation. And some people will say, well, that's just how God did it. It's like carrot and stick. So you've always got this carrot out. And it's like, that's like total deception, manipulation, manipulation. Plus another huge point that I like to bring up is, is that there were all kinds of promises made to those people in the first century that they were going to get relief from the persecution that they were facing. If they didn't, we've got a dishonest God. Um, and that's a much bigger deal than the wrong eschatology. Um, yeah, uh, Kelly says, so sad people have so many followers. Isn't that isn't that the truth? Um, yeah, some of these people that are actually false prophets, you know, like I like I showed with those videos, and that's one of the reasons I did it was, you know, they've been out for two or three days, 10, 20,000, 100,000, 200,000. Um, Greg Laurie has a video. I did just a real brief uh critique of that in my first live stream, again, which was just kind of a test run. But Greg Laurie has a video uh, on Revelation. It's like an overview of it. Um, he did uh, two, three years ago, somewhere in over a million views. And uh, he actually starts the video by saying that John's problem was that he was trying to use first century language to describe 21st century uh, events. Now, if that's not, you know, twisted up and cray. I don't know what, I don't know what is. Um, let's see. I'm just going down here to see if, any, if there are any new, new questions. Um, <laughs> awesome horror flick. Preterist. <laughs> I couldn't sleep for a week. I believe prayer is our weapon. God does answer prayer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yep. Well, other people say they were going to watch. So we'll, we'll at least do this. Um, you know, um, at least monthly, but we may do it more than that. Um, and I'm open to ideas too. Um, obviously I've got to do it in a way that I'm, that I'm comfortable with and led to do it. But if you have ideas on what might be most helpful, um, I'm, I'm more than open to that. Um, let's see. Um, someone saying here, um, somebody started this seven years ago when nobody was talking about it. He's been known to be a bit salty, but he's been on solid teaching for what he's given. Um, as far as uh, pre pre millennialism, um, yeah. So I'm still not perfectly clear on um, what the question might be there, but let me give you just um, 
a rundown. This is going to be basic. Let me recommend another book. Um, Pete Rue was here earlier um, in in the chat, and I don't know if he's there anymore. Pete and Rachel Rue, who is awesome people, they have two books, and the first one is um, why, what are we waiting for? I think it's the title. What are we waiting for? Um, one of the best on ramps to the preterist view, the fulfilled view. Um, beautifully laid out. Um, it's just 90, 100 pages, so it's easy to look through. You can kind of use it as a resource, but that's when I would definitely, if you're newer to this view, that's a great book. I think it's just called What Are We Still Waiting For? Pete and Rachel Rue, W-R-U-E, W-R-U-E. And they've just recently published a second book that goes through the four main views of eschatology. And I really I really like how they did that. Again, beautifully formatted. Um, and it basically, it goes through each view these are the scriptures they use. This is how they interpret them. And then quotes from people who actually hold that view. And it's a tremendous resource. But let me just give you those in case that's newer to you while, while I'm... Okay, there it is. Thank you, Pete. Uh, the return of Christ. Why are we still waiting? The return of Christ. Why are we still waiting? And Pete, what's the what's the title of the second book? I have both of them. I just... Uh, they're not with an eye shot. So if you give me that the title of your second book, I'll look at that. But basically, they're... Okay, here we go. End Times Explained understanding the different views and times explained understanding the different views is their second book highly recommend um, both of them um and then but the four major views are what's sometimes called pre-millennial dispensationalism sometimes it's just called dispensationalism sometimes just called pre-millennialism but it's basically the the left behind series movies view. It's uh, Hal Lindsey, The Late Great Planet Earth, which he wrote in 1970. It's that view where they see almost all the prophecies are yet future, and you got the, the rapture and the Antichrist. Israel is still God's chosen people. The church is sort of a stepchild trying to figure out where things went wrong. Sorry to be snarky about it. I I, I don't like the view. Um, it's, it's the one I learned first. I think it's actually been very, very harmful to the church and it creates the mentality for some notice I'm, i want to separate the teaching from the people who believe it because i have dear friends that hold to that view uh, but for many it's it's like they're you know why fight we're on the next flight i mean the rapture is going to happen anytime sure uh, you know we can rearrange the deck chairs with this the, the titanic sinking when they see bad things in the world they think oh that's how it's supposed to be Whew, well, i'm glad jesus is going to come and rescue me from pardon me this this crap hole so i don't have to do anything to like tell people about Jesus and be salt and light and an ambassador for Christ. I'll just wait here under the covers and just be raptured away. Um, that's dispensationalism. Amillennialism, a lot of people don't like that term because ah really means no, like an agnostic means no knowledge. So amillennial, amillennialism technically would mean no millennium, but that's not what amillennials, ah, amillennialists believe. Um, they actually believe we're in the millennium now some believe that the, that's happening in an earthly sense. Some uh, millennials would see it only in a heavenly sense. But their belief is that it's still generally things are going to get very bad over time. The millennium was not a thousand years, but it's stretched out for who knows how long. Um, the world might still get really bad. And then Jesus will come and save everybody. Um, Post millennialism has some overlap with ah millennialism, but basically believes that over time, um, the earth will get better and better. And a verse they would cling to, and I can't remember the reference right now. I want to say Isaiah somewhere. That helps, doesn't it? Somewhere in Isaiah 66 chapters, you'll find it. Um, <laughs> I don't know where that voice came from either, but it's, um, you know, the, the glory of the Lord will go out as the water covers, covers the sea. So in the post mill view, the earth gets better and better and better. And finally, when it's pretty much all better, uh, but death hasn't quite been defeated, then Jesus will come back. Then you have what's often referred to as partial preterism. And I see a lot of overlap between partial preterism and um, and post-mill view, where, where uh, especially in partial preterism, almost all the prophecies that Jesus gave in the Olivet Discourse have been fulfilled. But there's dual fulfillment that's still coming later. And then you have what's often referred to as full preterism, fulfilled eschatology. Some people call it covenant eschatology. But I know some preterists don't like that. Whatever, whatever your term is, um, is that it's all been fulfilled, and and um, so those are the main differences. Um, what do I think we should expect to happen for believers in the years to come? Um, what do you think we should expect to happen for believers? I could probably answer that a number of ways. Uh, 
one thing I, I hope as, as individual believers, we continue to love Jesus, love our families, um, live out Romans 14, um, as much as it is up to you, have peace with every person that you can. So, and in that way, here's the great thing. If um, there is a wonderful personal eschatology, we could say for every believer, regardless of what they actually believe, uh, which is that um, we already, and, and I believe this, especially from, from my perspective, we already enjoy the presence of Christ now in wonderful and marvelous ways. We already have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We're already you know, citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Now, the funny thing is all Christians really believe that in some sense, because you have to, because that's what the texts say, but you cannot, I don't think, really embrace that in any other any of the other views, because you're still waiting for a blessed hope that I would say we already have. And so I hope one of the things that happens for believers that we, especially as this view gets out, that we learn more and more how we can enjoy Christ and bask in his presence, that we're already loved and accepted, that we have full salvation. Here is something that's really important. We'll probably get into it another time more. But Hebrews 9.26 says that Jesus uh, came to put away sin. And then 9.27, it talks about um, each person is appointed to die once, and then the judgment, Hebrews 9.28. I'm not probably going to quote it perfectly, but it, but it says in, in, that basically he came then now to bring salvation. If Jesus has not returned, we do not have salvation. Everyone should still be in Hades. No one's in heaven. There's no final salvation. That's why Paul and other writers were saying, you know, our salvation is nearer now than we first believed. And what we've done is hijacked that. So every Christian now, yeah, it's nearer because when I die physically, then I'll have salvation. No, 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 no. A thousand times. No, it's not going on at all. Um, and I've forgotten the original question. So um, what should we expect? Again, those of us who have this view, we, we've got complete salvation now. Um, we're in the kingdom completely now. There's no already, not yet. And uh, and so, but the other thing I think is if view gets out more is people are going to be more kingdom minded. Now, within preterism, there are some people, and I, I don't hold this, but I, I respect a lot of people who do. They'll basically say, you know, if preterism doesn't help us get better at changing the culture, then, then who cares what we believe? I don't believe that because I think just believing the truth and just the integrity of Jesus is, is the most important thing. Um, cultural change is a byproduct of understanding that truth and having freedom in Christ in those truths. So I think the more people that come to the understanding of, I mean, just think of the difference between thinking this place is all going to be gone in 10 years and, oh, this place might be around in 10,000 years. That in and of itself is going to change the way we think about the future. So to try to get back to your question, I apologize if I've been a little clumsy with it, but individually, I hope more and more believers embrace this view, realize what they already have in Christ. But then I hope for the community of faith that as we embrace this and hold to this, we will become much more involved in culture, in the arts, in the political realm, um, in your writing, in the sciences, and all these things, realizing that, well, I want, I do want to create a better world because I now believe that my great, 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 great grandchildren are actually going to be here. So it's a whole different mindset in a worldview. So I hope that's what happens. And I think it is happening. Um, here is, this is, this is, this is awesome. Um, what did I miss here? Um, somebody said, uh, let me see if I can go back and find this person's question. Thanks. Um, cause I said, guess not. Thanks anyway. So I wonder, I'm sorry if I did, I wonder. Oh yes. Yeah, so let me just say this again. Um, I am going to, for any of you that want the list of verses, I am going to send them, but I, I can't do it right now. If I were more talented technologically, I probably could, but I'm going to do that later. Um, it might even be this afternoon or the next day, just because of my, my schedule later this morning and, and this afternoon. But so I'm going to give you my email. I'll give it one more time. Um, and then if you send me an email saying, I watched your live stream, please send me the verses. I'll send them to you. My email one more time, J-O-E-L dot R-O-S as in Sam E-N-A-U-E-R, J-O-E-L dot R-O-S-E-N at gmail.com. And I will send those out, send those verses out. Let me do one more, one more 
thing, maybe just maybe in a few minutes. What what I'll do is when we when we wrap this up in a few minutes, I will go ahead and screen share uh, my notes there, and you won't, you won't be able to see all the verses at once. But you can also take a screenshot of those with your phone. Um, I'm trying to think if there's. I know there's a website you can go to. It's David Green has listed actually 101 similar verses, but I don't remember exactly how to get there. So um, I'm not going to guess. Oh, history of preterism. So here's what I would say. Sometimes people say, well, preterism is like brand new and, and the church has not believed it. Why do you believe it? I would say actually it's got a history of of at least 2,000 years, since I believe this is what Jesus taught and the apostles and the Old Testament prophets. But in more recent history, um, there is one theory that I I don't really hold to, but uh, but in the in the period of the Reformation, so we're talking maybe late 1400s, 1500s, into the 1600s, some people might even put like Charles Spurgeon as the sort of the last reformer or part of that Puritan age, even a little bit later than that. But they, many of them, including you know Martin Luther, uh, we've done John Calvin, you know Zwingli, some of these other names in that movement. They were absolutely convinced that the Roman Catholic Church was Babylon and that the papacy were the Antichrists. And because of that, there were, and this is a you know a story you hear different versions, but there were a couple of Jesuit priests who wanted to do everything they could. So that people would stop blaming the Catholic Church for all this stuff, and so they, they maybe came up with some different different views that some people would say are kind of the roots of preterism. I'm not so sure about that. Um, I know that, um, yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot here to talk about um, because even like there's a, a man. What's his name? A pretty well known church historian, Kurt Aland, who had a couple of and he and Kurt Aland is not a you know, didn't hold to the preterist understanding at all, but he did a pretty good job of kind of saying, how did we you know, get to all this futurism? And um, that's a little bit different than your question, but I think it can lead there. Um, I think one of the things that very well may happen is that the church over time became more and more Hellenistic Greek in its thinking. And uh, one of the things that's so important to understand our view is the prophetic language and how the Hebrew prophets um, thought and taught. Somebody earlier mentioned my series, Prophet Land. That's what that was all about. You go through the Old Testament, several passages in Isaiah, um, Micah, you know, Hosea, Ezekiel. I mean, it's really all over the place where you read some of these things. And if those prophets were using literal judgment, the earth would have already been destroyed many, many times before we get, even get to Jesus. Here's the point of that. As the church became more Greek thinking, more, more literal in their thinking, uh, they were, you know, they were looking, they had, a, they had a different nature in mind. They were looking, well, well they believe Christ was going to come, you know, physically, like literally come out of the heavens and, you know, ride, ride down a cumulus cloud. Um, they were looking for, you know, physical bodies coming out of the graves at the end of time, um, you know, all that sort of thing. And, and, and then they realized, well, of course, those things have not happened yet. Um, there's the whole, and there's so many places to go here, the, the, you know, Philetus and, and, um, Hymenaeus, I'll go ahead and just touch on it, but they were, you know, there was this teaching that that these things had already happened, that the resurrection would happen, and and, uh, and uh, Paul was like, no, it hasn't happened yet. Well, if the resurrection, if what the Bible was talking about was that literal type of thing, all Paul would have had to say was, hey, guys, look outside, you know, the sun's still shining. You're... And so it's a misunderstanding, and that's, that's another huge thing we need to deal with, is that the nature of these events, I think, has been misunderstood largely by the church, and a lot of that was the more Hellenistic literal thinking that came into play. Um, and then over time, it was like the longer you know, people were waiting for this return, then and then it was, well, now maybe this event hasn't happened. Maybe this event hasn't happened. And people had to keep coming up. I mean, if none of it happens yet, then it's all fair game, right? Anybody can make up anything they want to. But getting back more specifically to your question, um, I have three books, if not four or five from the 1800s that are from full preterist authors. Um, so it was at least around in some form at that point. And I think when you look back in the history of the church, there's an awful lot where, where maybe the people weren't full preterists, but John Owen, for example, who's perhaps the most famous Puritan writer, um, he took Second Peter um, chapter 3, which is the, you know, the elements will melt with heat and stuff. He, he clearly saw that as, as not some future demolition of the planet, but, but he saw that as the he believed that they were in the new heavens and earth then. 
So when you look through, you know, it's only when you get to the 1830s, 40s, later than that, when you begin to see dispensationalism, which again is the, you know, Israel is a separate, they're God's chosen people, you know, the coming Antichrist, the rapture, all of that. That's actually a really, really new idea. At least partial preterism is is not new at all. And you can find a lot of this even in the early church fathers. And people use church fathers all the time, you know, to try to bolster their view. And I get that. The church fathers were kind of all over the place on some of this stuff. But you can see certainly the initial seeds of preterism, I think, all all through the history of the church. But it seems to be the 1800s, more people were writing on this. And then um, in the 1970s somewhere, there was a, a book written called The Spirit of Prophecy, which I have that was really helpful. And then it seems like for whatever reason, um, especially then um, in the later 1900s and, and uh, last few decades, uh, more and more people are looking to this. And I think one of the reasons for that is Israel became a nation in 1948, and and people knew that when Jesus said, you know, uh, when all these things happen, from their view, then we're in the final generation, and a biblical generation is usually seen to be about 40 years. So at that time, Israel was formed in 1948. Either the world was supposed to end in 1988, 40 years later, or Jesus was supposed to come in 1988, which they would have seen as seven years before the end of the world. And that's why you had this whole cottage industry created of books and movies and, and, and I mean, frankly, eschatological hooey, you know, that came from that time. And I think one of the reasons that this view of fulfillment is growing is because people are like, well, how, how long are we going to stretch this generation out? And they've seen failed prophecy after failed prophecy after failed prophecy and thinking, well, wait a minute, let's go back and re-examine that. Maybe the reason that these things haven't happened yet is because they all already happen. So that's kind of a an overview. Um, but that's, I guess that's what I would say. And there's definitely some exciting things happening. Now, the online presence has been huge in terms of this. Um, this person says, I'm a preterist, but I also believe it's internal and that we have to work on ourselves, the kingdom being within. So it's all internal. So I certainly understand that. One of the ways you can translate when Jesus said the kingdom is among you can sometimes it's translated among you sometimes it's translated within you um so i do believe that, that we're definitely citizens of the kingdom you know luke 21 i think no it might be 17 says the kingdom will not come with observation it's another huge flaw with dispensationalism but really all the other views is they're still looking for a future physical kingdom uh, when the scriptures teach first the physical then the spiritual and it don't go back the other way again and so I would say, yes, it's internal because the kingdom is about joy and righteousness and peace and those things. But I would also say that even though Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, that it is in this world. And that as people see themselves more and more of the citizens of the kingdom, it does have outworkings in the physical world. And um, we even see that in spades already. I mean, the the, the advances in, in literacy, for example, the advances in medicine, um, advances in the overall standard of living of really a majority of the planet, as I understand it, are, I think, a direct result in some ways of of Christians who were kingdom minded. Um, and especially that the whole founding of, of, of our nation, America, I say that because we've got other people watching from other places. But most of the most of the eschatology was post mill in that case. But um, but they believe that, um, you know, that they, that they were supposed to be a city on a hill. And that's one of the reasons all these great things came um, from those early generations of Americans that we enjoy now. And I see that very much as an outworking in the kingdom. So I personally wouldn't limit it just to things that are internal. Uh, but as more and more kingdoms realize that we're in that kingdom now, it also has very beneficial external uh, realities. Um, here's someone, this is, a, this is a, I've seen this come up a lot. I believe we are in the short season. This will be the short season of Satan and we need to learn the fruits and herbs to live on not to mention it's healthy. Here's why I disagree with that. Um, and not surprisingly, even within the preterist community, there are different ways to, to interpret exactly what Paul is referring to as Satan. But in Romans 16, 20, uh, he says, you will soon crush Satan under your feet. And so, and to me, this is a glorious truth. Um, and, and I do believe that there, this is another question that comes up. I, I am not convinced that there's no sort of demonic activity in any way, shape, or form. But as far as Satan having any influence being in a short season, I would I would say no, uh, because Paul said that that was soon going to be done 
away with. Hallelujah. So then people say, why is the world so wicked? Because we can be really wicked. That's why. Have you ever read James 1? You know, we have these desires within ourselves. Go through the scriptures. Satan is not blamed for people's individual evil in the scripture. Just not. We often use Satan as a way to get our own evil off the hook. It's that we have these evil desires within ourselves that then give birth to sin. Sin gives birth to James 1. James 1, 21-ish, somewhere in there. I think it's James 1. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't think Satan is to blame uh, for, for the evil that we have going around now. And I also think, this is controversial, but I think it's it's uh, documentable, and there have been some good things done on this, uh, that overall, actually, the world is getting much, much better. Um, and a lot of people say, what? You, it, it, we'll talk about that in, in some upcoming live streams. Um, we're going to be forced to live in the wilderness. Yeah, I just I have a disagreement with that. Um, and so much of that depends on the particular culture you live in, the circumstances, how free your nation is, and so forth. Oh, no problem. Um, yep, glad to get that email out. Um, there's a proper way of presenting different arguments where you give a proper presentation of views, particularly where they differ from one's own. This is called steel manning as opposed to straw manning, which is what people usually do to views they oppose. Okay, I like that. I wasn't familiar with that that term. Um, and then he goes on to say, this is a Mark. Uh, he says, the Ruse second book on the different views of eschatology does a good basic job of steel manning the various views. Okay, again, steel manning is a, thank, a new, newer term to me, but I think, yeah, basically straw man is you come up with all these arguments and oftentimes people won't actually talk to other people about their views, but they'll assume they know the other views. Yeah, but the steel manning is a way where you're actually you're doing it with integrity and finding out what these other views are. Absolutely. And I just know, because I know Pete and Rachel personally, and I hope it's okay to say this because um, I am, but, but they, even though I know their view, they purposely did not present their view in that second book uh, for exactly what you were saying, Marcus. They, they wanted to just give a fair presentation and let people be Bereans. You know, um, what did, what was that Fox news tagline that um, Bill O'Reilly had? Uh, Fair and balance, and then the spin stops here. So we, we, here's what it was. We, we report, you decide. That's what took me a long time to get there. We report, you decide, and that's what that book does. Um, so yeah, good, um, good stuff. Um, yeah, over five hundred souls were raised when Jesus arose, didn't they? There, yeah, it does. That's the interesting passage in Matthew twenty-seven. Yeah, um, somebody says exactly where we weren't in that audience that Jesus was speaking to, right? It's so important to see that original audience. Physical flesh can never go to the kingdom because our flesh is the outside of this kingdom. The kingdom is inside the fleshly body. Let me read that again. Physical flesh can never go to the kingdom because our flesh is in the outside of this kingdom. The kingdom is inside the fleshly body. The way I read that, I'm not I'm not quite understanding. I, I think that there is a misunderstanding of flesh. Uh, um, there are times when the Bible talks about flesh as being our physical bodies. But you think of all the perversions and the warped ideas of where our flesh is bad, our bodies are bad. That's actually, I'm not saying that's what your comment is saying, but I just want to address it. That's more of a Gnostic teaching, spirit good, body bad. But isn't it interesting in the creation story? And yes, I realize that within preterism, there are lots of different views of the creation story. Um, but I think there would largely be agreement, again, because this is what the text says. Um, you may have a different ideas about what it meant by what it says. But um, God said after each day, it is good. And after he creates humanity, he adds, it is very good. So I don't see our our fleshly bodies as being evil. Um and, and oftentimes when, because God said they were good. And so oftentimes when we're reading the New Testament and Paul and others, but a lot of talking about the, the flesh or the ways of the flesh, he's not talking about our physical flesh. I can prove it. Romans 8 says no one in the flesh can please God. That would mean no one ever can please God because if he's talking about the physical body, because we're all flesh. Flesh is often meaning people under the old covenant law Flesh is people's own efforts to get to God, to earn acceptance with God. And it often refers to that. In fact, flesh more often refers to that than it does to our physical bodies. It's a big misunderstanding. I believe it's caused a lot of misinterpretations of Scripture. Satan was bound for a thousand of years under his feet. 
um, that yeah, that goes into a whole different discussion about the thousand and what the millennium means. Let me recommend, um, and I and I, I mean this sincerely. I think there are a lot of people that are better Bible students than I am, uh, and probably explain things better. Uh, but I will recommend that you, if you haven't already, check out some of the other things on my channel. I, I'd love it if you like and subscribe and share. Click that little notification bell, um, because one of the things I'm trying to do is. Um, and, and people have told me that I am doing that. So it's great to have that affirmation. I try to to not get too convoluted because it's so, I mean, there's so much to this topic. I hate to call it a topic because it's a lot more than that, but it's easy to get in the weeds and talk about so many things and people's heads are just spinning. So I try to, um, you know, on my videos to present things fairly clearly. And I'm always thinking about presenting them in a way that can help you then present them to others. So a lot of people have told me they've, they've been able to understand things. And so if you go to my playlists, like I have a whole series in Revelation that I think would be very helpful to people. Um, I just recently did, I exegeted the whole book of, not the whole book, um, chapter three of Second Peter. I did that because I, I got in a Facebook engagement with someone and that, and that was the launching pad for that. Um, and so Anyway, I think my channel might be might be helpful, but I do a three part series on the millennium there that might be helpful as well. Yeah, Pete says Jeremiah seventeen nine. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And I think his point in saying that is, yeah, do we really need Satan to be wicked? Nope. Um, Leanne, I've been pondering that perhaps evil demonic activity might be happening outside the gates where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Believers are inside the gates. Great point. That's one thing. Uh, you know, one of the very um, paradigm shifting ideas that that, that we believe if, if you believe in in fulfillment is that we're in the new heavens and earth now and that sounds so bizarre because people will say but the new heavens and earth is perfect not according to isaiah 65 and 66 not according to revelation 21 and 22 just like leanne pointed out there's there's evil there's dogs outside the city gates there's the immoral it says other things that uh, revelation 21 i want to say verse 7 or might be verse 11. Um, this speaks of that. Isaiah talks about, you know, that people are still going to die. And so uh, the new heavens and the new earth, as taught in scripture in those passages, are speaking of uh, the covenantal change, um, not literal physical new heavens and new earth. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, he said, um, the heavens and earth will not pass away until every jot and tittle of this law. Is so actually, from a biblical perspective, if we believe Jesus was talking about the physical heavens and earth, we should all be 100% under every bit of the law. Um, I also believe we have both God and Satan inside of us, the ego, carnal mind, and the spirit. Heaven is the crown of our head and hell is the heel or the root. We have to learn and know ourselves. So I would say, uh, this is from Candy, and, and no disrespect, I'm really glad you joined in. I would see that as much more of a new age mystical idea rather than a biblical idea. There's nothing in scripture that would remotely point to us having Satan inside ourselves. So I would just encourage you to um, to really look at that carefully. Um, that's, that's just not something at all that you're going to find in the Bible. Um, yeah, and there's another from Yah about, about a thousand years and Satan's little season. Um, perishable cannot inherit the perishable, imperishable. Um, yeah, so, okay. So anyway, um, I, I'm going to have to go in a couple minutes. Um, I'd ask for your prayers. I am, um, I am part of a local church here in Twin Falls. I, I know a lot of you would like to be and, and can't be, or you've gotten kicked out. I actually know one lady who's gotten kicked out of three churches. Um, I don't know why I'm laughing. Um, but I pray for me. Um, there, maybe share more about this another time. I've got to be brief here. Um, but uh, both pastors have actually been very welcoming to me. They they may not know you know some of this terminology and study this as much as I have. I'm not saying I know more than I do. I just think it hasn't been as as uh, much of an area of study. But they really both come at scripture from what I would call probably a post mill partial preterist type of paradigm. Talk about alliteration. But right now, we just started Daniel, we being them. It's weird for me just to go and like sit and listen. It's, it's weird. Um, and to be a preterist. You know? but, but at any rate, we just started preaching through Daniel. Then it's going to be Colossians, then Revelation. And, and I, it gives you your prayers because I know Daniel and Revelation are going to be taught 
differently than I believe. They, they, they this would be so. Uh, but I'm trying uh, because I, I want to have local relationships with people. I want to love them. It's a very loving church. I think they've got a lot right. Uh, but I, I need to head out in uh, just a few minutes. And so what I want to do here is, um, okay, and here's another one. Satan is deceiving the people that are already wicked. I think only Satan could organize what's going on with the nations. The Antarctic Treaty, proof they're all working together. Yeah, so there, there's, you know, there's a lot of um, interesting thoughts there. Um, and um, I just... Uh, I don't share some of those thoughts, and that, that's okay. Uh, Ray Campbell, thank you. Great teaching, Joel. I'll tell you one, one really, really cool thing. Uh, there's there's two couples, and, and one of the couples is both watching here, but just recently moved to this area who all are believers in fulfillment. And, and like I, I'm just over the moon excited about that. So I am just so encouraged that you're still all here, and if we had more time, we could keep going. But what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to put up my notes again, just so that way, if you want to take a picture of these scriptures, um, you can do that. And again, you, you could screen, you could screenshot them. Let me give my email one more time. And if you want those lists of scriptures, email me, say I watched the live stream, and then I can email you back with the scriptures. My email one more time, J-O-E-L dot R-O-S as in Sam, E and as in Nancy, A-U-E-R. J O E L dot R O S E N A U E R at gmail.com. Tell me you watch the live stream and you want those scriptures and I'll get them to you. And I may also include the link of it. There's a place you can find even, even a lot more than that, but let me go ahead. I'm going to pull this up. So if you want to just get a screenshot or if you can write like a banshee, um, write like a banshee, uh, you, you can, you can try that too. So let me just, um, I might actually figure out how this stuff works over time. So let me uh, go ahead and um, share this. And make it a little bit bigger here. And I can get my little head. Watch, check this out. Bam. Oops, wrong one. There I am. Get my little head out of the way here. So here are... What I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, put these up and then just leave them for a minute or so, then scroll down. Um, and so I'll try to get them quick. So here's yeah, kind of where we started. Matthew 16, 27, 28, Mark 8, 38, 9, 1. If you want to screenshot those. I This might change what you're seeing just a little bit. I've got a couple extra little lights here. And I just want to turn them off to save the battery. This has been a, a blast. I'm just super encouraged by all of you. And if you have come to this belief and shared it with anybody, just bless you. You're a brave soul. Sometimes people don't like it. Um, okay. And then we'll go down. And some, here's some other verses here. And again, there are the, the at best count, there seem to be 101 verses that, that have time statements just from the New Testament alone. I'll leave these up for a minute. And I made just a couple of brief notes under them, but just for clarity, I tried not to do much commentary on them so you can look at them for yourself. Okay, so hopefully you're able to screenshot those if you wanted them that way. Here's some more. And I did not read all of these either. And so even for those of you that tuned in, just, you know, just know there are some there that I didn't that I didn't even get to. Okay, and I'll just go probably the next time we scroll down, it'll pretty much take care of the rest of them, I would think. Not quite. Hello from Kansas. Someone says, thank you for the fellowship. You are absolutely welcome. Hello from Kansas. So I... I uh, was born in Minnesota, then I spent a few years in Nebraska, so not too far from Kansas. I love college football, and when I lived in Nebraska, the Nebraska Cornhuskers were blowing pretty much everybody away. The great coach, Tom Osborne, now they've been kind of awful for a long time. It's I've needed therapy. All right, let's go down here. Um, so here are the last verses. And again, I didn't even read all of them, and there are many more than this. It's a great study. 
just look over these verses. And this is the way you might approach someone. You know, you know your family members. Your if you're part of a church, you know them. You know your friends, coworkers, whomever. You know them way better than I do. And you might, if if someone even has a little bit of interest, you might say, "Hey, would you would you consider just getting together over a cup of coffee?" And I, you know, I. I've been studying this stuff. You might even say to them, because it's probably true, if, if, if you've just first been studying it, you might say, you know, I, I'm just, I'm really wrestling with some of these things. And, and I, I value your opinion. And would you be willing to look at some scriptures with me? Maybe they would. You never know. And you can just show them some of these. It can be really effective too. Again, if, you, if you're comfortable with the person, you might say, hey, would you, would you read that? Out, out loud because I just I just kind of want to hear it because there's something about when somebody is reading something out loud, they're hearing it in a different way too. And I, I just think it can be an effective way to do it. Okay. So I hope you're able to get those again. Um, if not, just uh, email me the address I gave. Tell me you passed the, watched the live stream and you would like to see those notes um, for, the, for the scripture verses. Please like, share, and subscribe. Um, Let's get this message out there. Um, also, just one final thought, and I'll I'll talk about this more specifically maybe next time. But there's a there's a conference at Berean Bible Church, but which is in um, Virginia Beach, Virginia, and that's like literally right around the corner. They do one every April, and some of you are probably already familiar with that. But there's a brand new one in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Jonesboro, Arkansas. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. In August, and uh, I'm hoping to be there. Um, and, uh, I just, just, yeah, I, so I, I'll talk about that more later, but, but I just, just need some, uh, provision to, to get there. And, but the Lord has provided some work and, and, you know, for those of you who don't know my story, you're like, what, why are you talking about that? But it's not all about me, but the point is I'm really hoping to go, um, and just kind of have to see where I am as it gets a little bit closer in terms of that. Um, I know, cause I talked to one of the guys yesterday, they, they've already got, you know, good sign up started. You can still sign up for that. But if you look up Arkansas Eschatology Conference on Facebook or on YouTube, that's Arkansas <laughs> Eschatology Conference, you'll, 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 uh, you'll find it. And uh, I think it's, you know, it's going to be a great time. Great lineup of speakers, Gary DeMar, Don Preston, David Curtis, Bob Kukchank, I think Zach Davis, who, and Travis Drum, who helped pastor the church there. I think they're both speaking, and I'm missing somebody. Michael Sullivan. Uh, it's going to be a great lineup. So that's in, in August. So you've got some time to plan, and what a great time that would be. At any rate, thank you again for joining in. I love this, and thanks for your encouraging comments. So we'll, we'll do it again. Like I, I'll start it at least once a month, but maybe we'll go weekly. Uh, we'll just see. Um, some of you already did, but, but let me know, you know, Keep making comments as you watch this. I want to make sure that the sound was good. I want to make sure that the things that I thought you could see on your screen, you could, which would have been the videos and then my notes, because I'm still learning how to work with this, with the software and stuff. Um, but great to see you. And uh, just like I do in every video, Pastor Joel saying bye for now.